Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 5th of August. I'm Erin Viner, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. U.S. President Barack Obama is preparing for his televised address to the American people later tonight about the Iranian nuclear deal as the battle for the hearts and minds of public opinion swings into high gear. The speech follows Obama's meeting with American Jewish leaders yesterday in what was a direct attempt to convince, convince them to support the pact just hours after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made the opposite pitch. Here with more is IBA's diplomatic correspondent, Ellie Wogelinder. In a fresh history-evoking bid to win support, President Barack Obama will present the Iran nuclear deal tonight as the most momentous foreign policy decision since the 2002 war in Iraq. In the commencement address to be delivered at American University in Washington, Obama will plead with the American people to take a chance, put their faith in him, and back an agreement with Iran. Washington University is where President John F. Kennedy gave a speech in support of reaching a nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union, and Obama is expected to recall Kennedy's efforts to curb nuclear tests as a worthy example to follow. Tonight's speech follows Obama's meeting yesterday with some two dozen prominent Jewish Americans in the cabinet room at the White House. The meeting lasted around two hours and was also attended by Vice President Joe Biden, National Security Advisor Susan Rice, representatives from the religious streams, the World Jewish Congress, the Anti-Defamation League, AIPAC, and J Street. Obama explained that if the deal is rejected, it will be a disaster, and that a U.S. attack on Iran will not lead to war, but to an asymmetrical balance of power, such as increased support of terrorism and more rockets on Tel Aviv. Israel would bear the brunt of a U.S. military strike, said Obama. The meeting also featured a prolonged back and forth with Lee Rosenberg, the chairman of AIPAC and a close friend of Obama's. Rosenberg protested that the president presented opponents to the deal as warmongers. Obama reportedly said it was fine for the organization to spend millions of dollars on efforts to kill the deal, but AIPAC's ad should not say that Jews who support the deal are bad Jews or hurting Israel's security. Obama said the heated debate over the deal's risks is tearing the Jewish community apart and causing irreparable damage. If you can't fight the deal on the merits, you will weaken the coherence of the Jewish community and harm the U.S.-Israel relationship, said Obama. Here's a look at one of the AIPAC ads. The Iran nuclear deal. Good deal or bad deal? Iran keeps their nuclear facilities. Military sites can go uninspected. Restrictions end after 10 years. Then Iran could build a nuclear weapon in two months. Iran has violated 20 international agreements and is the leading state sponsor of terrorism. Congress should reject a bad deal. We need a better deal. Obama told the group, you can spend 20 or 50 million dollars on a campaign, but you can't publish ads that say that if you are against the deal, you are a bad Jew or anti-Israel. Talk about the facts and not about what you think might help you, you convince people to oppose the deal. Obama's meeting with the Jewish leaders came a few hours after they participated in a live webcast with Prime Minister Netanyahu that was broadcast to synagogues and community centers across the country. Organizers said about 10,000 people participated in that meeting. Netanyahu was blunt as well in his remarks, broadcast from his office in Jerusalem, calling it a dangerous deal that would lead to war and a nightmare regional nuclear arms race. The most important point I have to make today is this. The nuclear deal with Iran doesn't block Iran's path to the, palm, to the bomb. It actually paves Iran's path to the bomb. Worse, it gives Iran two paths to the bomb. Iran can get to the bomb by keeping the deal, or Iran could get to the bomb by violating the deal. I don't oppose this deal because I want war. I oppose this deal because I want to prevent war. And this deal will bring war. It will spark a nuclear arms race in the region, and it would feed Iran's terrorism and aggression. That would make war, perhaps the most horrific war of all, far more likely. What we do now will affect our lives and the lives of our children and grandchildren in Israel, in America, everywhere. This is a time to stand up and be counted. Oppose this dangerous deal. Thank you. At the State Department briefing yesterday, a question was asked about Netanyahu's efforts to mobilize the American public against the deal and against the Obama administration. I think we just need to be as transparent and, and open as possible. Um, we understand there are critics out there of the deal. Um, and we've been, as I said, uh, we've uh, certainly the secretary, under Secretary Sherman, uh, Secretary Moniz, have been very, very um, uh, forward-leaning in trying to 
convince the American people, mm-hmm. and certainly Congress. Uh, and then also, as you saw with the Secretary's trip to the GCC, right. uh, other countries in the region and around the world, that this is a good deal. And we'll continue to make that case. But, you know, this is uh, partly a, a matter of free speech. Others are, are certainly uh, have every right to, to make the case otherwise, uh, mm-hmm. but it won't sway us in our determination. So you're not bothered by the fact that a foreign leader is basically addressing and sort of uh, pushing, if you will, Americans uh, to sort of stand against a deal that you work so hard for. That does not bother you? Well, again, uh, you know, the Secretary's been very clear. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we recognize uh, the, Israel prim- uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's um, um, disagreement, I guess, uh, around, about the deal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, there are other voices in Israel who think it is a good deal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, the American people, and as, in, as we would hope for any people anywhere, can look at a variety of sources. Mm-hmm. Um, we feel, however, we, and I, by we, I mean the entire P5 plus one, have made and will continue to make a compelling case <coughs> that this deal is the best deal uh, and, and frankly shuts off uh, every pathway for uh, Iran to uh, obtain a nuclear weapon. In his meeting with Jewish leaders, Obama said that he is ready to meet with Netanyahu and discuss the necessary measures needed to make Israel feel safer after the Iran deal. But Netanyahu has refused to hold a meeting, Obama said, because meeting me would be for him like waving a white flag. And Netanyahu wants us to keep fighting over the agreement. Earlier today, I spoke with former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Michael Oren of the Kulano Party about the Iran deal and Obama's meeting with Jewish American leaders. Well, let's say this. The proponents of the deal... People who support the deal say the choice is either between the deal and war. Uh, if that is true, if the Iranians actually believed that there was a credible military threat, we would have had a much better deal. Okay. Even the supporters of the agreement uh, agree, they acknowledge, that Iran is eventually going to be a nuclear power. It's going to have nuclear weapons. Whether it happens in a couple of years or happens in 10 years, Iran going to be a nuclear power. Uh, the president uh, warned that you know, if the deal doesn't go through, Tel Aviv is going to be struck by rockets. So, uh, as any, I think any Israeli would say, that if we had to defend ourselves uh, against incoming rockets, wouldn't we rather defend ourselves against those rockets before Iran has the nuclear weapons rather than uh, after Iran has the nuclear weapons? The prediction was made that if the deal falls through, uh, Iranian missiles will fall on Tel Aviv. I am a resident of Tel Aviv. My children, my grandchildren uh, live in Tel Aviv. And given the choice between facing that possibility, that horrible possibility of missiles raining on Tel Aviv and facing an Iranian nuclear weapon that could fall on the state of Israel and threaten not just our security, but our very existence, of course, I will choose the lesser of those two evils. Senator John McCain has come out and said that this deal gives Iran the confidence to strike Israel. Do you agree with that assessment? During the Cold War, and I think John McCain will remember this, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States built up large missile arsenals in order not to use them. But that's not the way it works in the Middle East. Organizations like Hamas and, and Hezbollah, we know they build up missile arsenals precisely to use them. And, and therefore, we know they're eventually going to use them, and we know that with the influx of hundreds and billions of dollars uh, in cash, of sanctions relief to Iran, Iran will use that money not to pave roads and build schools. It will use it to increase the efficacy, the, the lethalness of the Iranian, of the, of the Hezbollah and Hamas missiles, which they will eventually use against us. President Obama said in that meeting yesterday that this issue has the potential danger of splitting the American Jewish community. Isn't it already split? This is a community that supports Obama, votes Democratic overwhelmingly. Israel is not a high priority for them. Are we already at a split between the American Jewish community and Israel? We're standing in front of the Knesset here. I don't know if you can see it in the background. In that building, many Jews in there, uh, and we agree on just about nothing. We spend a lot of time arguing with each other. Um, But when it comes to the choice between having a... Argument between Jews, which, as you'll acknowledge, is, is not, so ar- not so rare, uh, and a, an existential threat, a threat not just to our security, to, but to our potential survival, I'll take the argument. President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu are not meeting, have no plans to meet right now. We have 17 more months of the Obama presidency. How do you foresee those 17 months going? Will Obama and Bibi ever meet? 
I don't know, I'm not a prophet, but the United States-Israel relationship, its alliance, is much bigger than two individuals. It's not, this is not a personal issue. Uh, there is a, an historic alliance between Israel and the Congress, between Israel, the Israeli people and the American people, where support for Israel uh, among Americans is at a near all-time high. And that's not going to change. President Reuven Rivlin today hosted a delegation of U.S. Democratic congressional representatives at his official residence in Jerusalem who are in the country as part of an educational trip to the area. The president emphasized Jerusalem's strong ties with Washington. Several of the visitors spoke with Israel Television's Miriam Kirschenbaum about the upcoming congressional vote on the Iranian nuclear deal, while also echoing the president's statements about the unbreakable bonds that exist between the two countries. We feel very much that this agreement is a first step to legitimize Iran's policies and strategies and really only acts to further unstabilization of the chaotic region and the whole world. However, this deal alone does not leave Israel defenseless. As a strong democratic country in the region, Israel can and will do all that is necessary to defend itself. Whatever Congress decides, it will be your decision. Uh, you are the representatives of the American people, and we know that as representative, you have to get into conclusion and on decision. We, as your allies and partners, must make sure that whatever the result of this vote, our strategic allies stand and grow, grow even stronger. I think the, the reality, and I think President Obama makes this clear, and President Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu makes this clear, uh, that the relationships between our two countries is very strong uh, and will be uh, strong uh, through this particular issue uh, into the future. Our message is, I think, a unified message of a uh, very strong relationship uh, between the United States and Israel, a commitment to democracy, a commitment to freedom, uh, a commitment to uh, resolving uh, differences in peaceful ways. And I think that uh, the, the delegation's visit is a reaffirmation of that relationship. I don't think that the President of the United States desires to attack Iran or any place else. I think that we're looking for opportunities to bring stability and peace uh, without having to, to resort to any kind of war. One of my concerns, I've been in Congress now 22 years. Uh, I've been to Israel 12 times and there has always been a unity between the United States and Israel throughout history, not just the last 22 years. And what I've seen the last year or two, uh, it, it bothers me because it takes away from that unity that the United States and Israel has. Um, when we passed the sanctions over the years in support for Israel, we have 435 members of the House of Representatives. We would get 400 votes for those uh, kind of things to help Israel. Uh, but if you make it a partisan basis, Democrats versus Republicans, I think we'll all lose, and particularly Israel will, because, you know, we'll be in charge sometime, uh, Republicans will be in charge sometime, but I want Israel to be, have bipartisan support, and that's why I think this time of the conflict between the president, we shouldn't let personalities get in the way of friends, and I think that's, that's happening. Much criticism has been expressed in recent days over the lack of negative reaction to Palestinian firebomb attacks against Israeli victims. State Department spokesman Mark Toner countered that trend with a brief statement about the Monday night firebombing in East Jerusalem that seriously wounded a 27-year-old Israeli woman. We strongly condemn last night's terrorist firebomb attack on an Israeli vehicle in East Jerusalem which resulted in a woman being badly burned. Uh, we wish a swift recovery uh, to her and call on local authorities to bring the perpetrators to justice. It is critical that restraint is exercised by all sides and that provocative actions and rhetoric cease. Uh, we call on all sides to lower tensions and obviously we discourage any more violence. 
Three right-wing Jews are being held on administrative detention orders for alleged extremist activities. The attorney general gave the go-ahead to make the arrests following the recent wave of Jewish ultra-nationalistic violence. Until now, the legal practice has traditionally been applied to suspected Palestinian terrorists. IBA's Dennis Zinn brings us more in this report. As of this afternoon, three young right-wing extremists have been arrested and will most likely be placed under administrative detention. The remand of suspected Jewish underground member Mayor Ettinger was extended until Sunday by the Nazareth Magistrates Court. Ettinger is the grandson of slain and outlawed Kach leader Mayor Kahana, who advocated expelling Arabs from Israel. He is currently under a court order barring him from entering Jerusalem and the West Bank. It's still not clear whether or not he was involved in the Duma attack. Two other youths have been arrested in the area of Jerusalem. They too face an administrative detention order. One has been identified as Mordechai Meir, an 18-year-old resident of Malay Adumim. It was the murderous attack in the West Bank Palestinian village of Duma which resulted in the death of a Palestinian infant and the severe burning of his parents and young brother that persuaded the government to allow harsher interrogation and arrests of Jewish nationalists who were suspected of carrying out violence to further their political goals. The arrests were made after Attorney General Judah Weinstein was convinced to finally give his nod of approval. Administrative detention means that detainees can be incarcerated without trial for an indefinite period. Up to now, this practice was used mainly against suspected Palestinian terrorists who were considered ticking bombs. In a curious move today, the police published a request asking the public to turn in all information that may be available concerning the Duma arson and other attacks that have been carried out in recent months, including vandalism against Arab and Christian institutions. Dennis Zinn, IBA News. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is in Cairo today for talks with regional leaders. He arrived in the Egyptian capital last night, where he met with the Secretary General of the Arab League, Nabil al-Arabi. He also had a meeting with Egyptian Foreign Minister Sami Shukri, ahead of today's session of the 22-member Arab organization. The Palestinian Ma'an news agency is reporting that the agenda for the talks includes the recent incidents in Israel, such as last week's killing of the 18-month-old Palestinian toddler in the Duma arson attack by suspected extremist Jews. Abbas is expected to remain in Egypt for tomorrow's opulent opening of the new Suez Canal. The government has permitted a West Bank Arab soccer team to cross Israeli territory to enter Gaza for the first time in 15 years. Israeli authorities gave permission for the West Bank champs Ali Al-Khalil from Hebron to make the journey so that they can challenge the top Gaza Shazaya team for the Palestine Cup trophy. A return leg will be played in Hebron on August 9th, with the winner on aggregate booking a place in the Confederation Cup in Asian football. The Gazan Soccer Federation hosted a lavish reception for the West Bank players and called the match a milestone for Palestinian soccer. Both sides expressed the hope that there would someday be unified competitions between the two Palestinian territories. The Israeli decision follows last month's failed political effort by the Palestinian Federation to have Israel removed from FIFA for alleged restrictions placed on the movement of Palestinian soccer teams. They withdrew their motion at the last minute and FIFA agreed to send observers to monitor the situation. Ministers kicked off marathon deliberations over the next state budget this morning. Even though the two-year financial plan is expected to pass the cabinet vote and make its way to the Knesset for final approval, many challenges still remain. Among them is insistence by the defense ministry that it receive five billion shekels more than Finance Minister Moshe Kahlon is prepared to allocate. It also remains unclear whether Economy Minister Arya Derry will instruct the other Shas Party Minister to vote against the plan due to a dispute over their list of demands that include the removal of value-added tax from basic items and an increase in the minimum wage along with a reduction in public transportation fees and lower taxation on low-income households all of which were Shah's set of conditions when it agreed to join the coalition. As of this hour, Derry has been boycotting the talks in protest of a deadlock in negotiations, along with the Shah's Minister of Religious Affairs, David Azulai. 
Now taking a look at local finance and the shekel today put in a mixed performance in foreign currency trading while share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange were up across the board. Here's a look at the numbers. Turning to the weather, and as bad as the heat wave is here, it's even worse in neighboring Jordan. Temperatures hit highs of 45.5 degrees Celsius in Aqaba this week, which is just about 114 for those of you who still think in Fahrenheit, and up to 42 in Amman. As residents of the capital in the Hashemite Kingdom searched for relief from the scorching heat, municipal workers sprayed them with water, whether they liked it or not. The police have been a little gentler by handing out bottles of water and juice. Here at home, we're likely to see a very slight drop in the heat stress tomorrow, although we're really not going to feel it that much as the Sharaf Desert heat wave continues to plague the nation with unseasonably high temperatures. You're looking at the forecast at home and abroad over the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow when I'll be back to bring you the latest breaking news from Israel. I'm Aaron Viner wishing you a great evening and shalom from Jerusalem. Jerusalem.